morning everybody oh just get myself correctly sorted out here okay that's a bit better morning everybody welcome to activate her sorry i just want to check oh okay i just remembered that the wonderful our wonderful waste technicians are coming this morning friday and so i wanted to make sure that our bins had been put out but they have so good morning everybody welcome to activate her with me sally goodwin on this feast of a friday to uh, the next episode or program or session or whatever you would like to call it of friday feasts Friday feast, I think we have it singular. Good morning, Hanley. Good morning, Halette. Good morning, Sonia. The names are flying up, <laughs> all coming up together. Good morning, Roz. Good morning, Simone. Good morning, Bertha. Welcome, welcome, everybody. So good to see you all here this morning. Good morning, Tessa, my lovely. It is a beautiful Friday morning, um, a bit cooler, thank the Lord. Good morning, Sebs. Lovely to have you on, my friend. Um, and yeah, it is lovely and cool where I am right now. The sun is starting to peek through the clouds, but good morning, good morning, summer sky, beautiful girl. Good morning, Michelle, my lovely. Welcome, Claudia. <laughs> thank you thank you for looking forward to what is being brought to the table this morning for us to feast on yeah it is um it's been a bit of a kind of a i mean every morning i have a lengthy conversation with the lord around what message we're going to bring good morning renil way um, but, you know, there are so many women in the Bible. Good morning, Conrad. Welcome, my friend, who that are significant. Um, I mean, all the women in the Bible are significant, but there's so many that because I've researched them for my book and all of that, um, that they're just so close to my heart. So picking out sort of one or two to um, to speak about on this platform is actually quite difficult. Oh, hang on, I feel like my, goodness me, I feel a bit wild and woolly today. <laughs> but, um, so welcome everybody. It is Friday the 8th of March, 2024, and it is the 28th of Adar 1, 5784. Okay, so if you can hear that noise in the background, you... <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad, Summer Sky. I'm so glad that that teaching um, resonated with you. Quite a few people reached out to me actually and said that that teaching really resonated with them. And I think that it's so important just to be taught, you know, correctly, um, the correct biblical theology about, about Adam and Eve. And there is more, you know, to teach on them, but the just in terms of, I think I mentioned it briefly on Wednesday, there is a Hebrew word used. Good morning, Joyful Jen. There is a Hebrew word used um, called Ezer, which in Genesis is often translated as help meet. And then often that is used as a reason to suggest that women were simply created to be helpers to men, you know, to be um, support them and kind of almost like a second, you know, sort of like God looked at Adam and thought, oh, he can't do this alone. He needs someone to support him and to stroke his ego and to, you know, encourage him. And actually that word Ezer is translated, good morning, heroic Hilda. That word Ezer is translated so differently in other parts of the Bible. Um, it has connotations of the word um, of the word warrior. It has connotations of strength, and it's it's an enormous um, theological discussion around that specific word. Good morning, Tamsin. Good morning, Special Sylvia. 
Um, it's an enormous theological discussion around that specific word. Uh, but it is good morning, Sisiba. Welcome, my friend. But um, it is actually a word that is used in other places in the Bible for God and for the Holy Spirit. Good morning, Curl. Welcome. So, um, you know, in terms of the way God and the way the Holy Spirit um, supports us and encourages us and, um, and, you know, wars on our behalf and is our strength and our, um, you know, support in times of trouble. And, you know, it has a much more um, kind of very strong connotations or characteristics in other places where it's used actually to represent God or to represent the Holy Spirit. Good morning, Estrelita. Welcome. Oh, yes, please, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like and share, I would so appreciate that to get the word of the Lord out um, to all those who need to hear it, and particularly when it relates to significant women and also obviously because all of you are my, good morning Lynette, lovely Lynette, all of you are my, what do they call them, digital evangelists or media missionaries, I think that's what my friend Stuart always says. So yeah, so that word Ezer that is translated as kind of helpmate or help meet um, in Genesis and then, you know, taught to have this connotation of sort of women just being playing this um, supportive role to Adam and Adam not needing to be supportive at all back is just it's the only time in the Bible that it's actually translated like that almost in a kind of a weaker you know with undercurrents of second um, choice or second class or second you know everywhere else good morning wonderful Volna everywhere else that it's translated is a match you know it's trying good morning lindy lovely lindy welcome good morning brigitte it is translated actually with a, a much more of a warrior undertone much more of a strong support you know role and it's also used where um you know the woman supports the man and the man supports the woman it's a mutual relationship not not a one-sided relationship you know that the man is the only one deserving of support so it really is, I'm just actually looking to see, I have, if, if you ever need any recommendations about books regarding like women in leadership, women in ministry, I have ton. I mean, I have loads, I've read so many um, books on that sort of thing, but this book, um, Taryn Williams, his book on how God sees women is excellent. It is an excellent it's an excellent book in terms of just, you know, um, somebody who is a, a well-respected, and in fact, Taryn Williams has won international acclaim for this book. And he, um, some of the most well-known, well-respected um, theological scholars have rated his book extremely highly and he is very involved in good morning tishka he's very involved in lots of conversations um, around women in leadership women in ministry and he because he's a theologian and a scholar he unpacks those verses in the bible that are often used to to um, tell women that they can't be you know as much as men he unpacks all of that sort of thing in here and it's it's a brilliant book it's not difficult reading um but it's really really good so taryn williams how god sees women is a book i would really recommend there's another book by an american scholar called beth allison barr b-a-r-r and her book is called um biblical womanhood yeah, it's something like, I can't remember the exact title, it's Biblical Womanhood, and then um, this Terran's book you can order online. If you go to his website, um, I think his website is Terran Williams, T-E-R-R-A-N, Williams, all one word, and then you can actually order his book online. I think it's also on Amazon. I think it's also on Amazon. But obviously, if you're in South Africa, it's better to just order it straight from him. So, yeah, Beth Allison Barr, The Makings of Biblical Womanhood, that's it. The Makings of Biblical Womanhood. She is an American um, theolo um, theological scholar. She has a PhD in women's history, 
in the history of women. And um, she is, um, you know, she's been in ministry, all that sort of thing. And her, um, her book on the makings of biblical womanhood is absolutely fantastic. There is another book also, um, Katya Adams. I'm sure most of you have heard of Julian and Katya Adams. They um, originally from Julian's from South Africa. I, th I can't think of Katya is as well, but they've and they've moved across to um, Boston in the United States. And Katya Adams has written a book called Equal and um, absolutely excellent especially it's um, it's quite theological but um, but it's very you know it's it's extremely well written and it's 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 a brilliant book so those three books um, Equal by Katya Adams, The Makings of Biblical Womanhood by Beth Allison Barr and Taryn Williams, How God Sees Women. If you're interested in just, you know, informing yourself or learning a little bit more about, um, you know, the, the theology around the verses that have often been used and are still used um, in church spaces to relegate women to something slightly less than men, then that's a very good, those are very good places to start. I would definitely suggest that you, that you start there. Okay, so the reason we're looking at all of this, or not the reason, because basically that's what one of the things my ministry is based on, but um, it is International Women's Month. Now our Women's Month is in August, I know that, but um, March is International Women's Month, and today, the 8th of March, is International Women's Day. So South Africa, because we like to be different, we have our own Women's Month in, in August, and we know why, because it's to celebrate the women who protested the past laws, very significant, um, very, you know, very worthy of celebration, um, a, brilliant, a brilliant day to celebrate what women have done in history. So good morning, special Sunette. Good morning, Julie. Lovely to see you, my friend. So, um, but, but because it's International Women's Month, oh, thank you, Halette. Um, Halette has put the link in her comment if you want to go and have a look at Taryn Williams's book. Good morning, my gorgeous Arena. Hold on, I just need to unhide her comment. There we go, Facebook aren't happy with her advertising in my comments. Uh, good morning, my lovely Arena. So, so it's International Women's Month and it is International Women's Day today. And it is also on Sunday, just a, just a, um, a note on Sunday evening at sunset on Sunday evening we cross over into Adar 2 so we in Adar 1 at the moment remember I've told you before about how this is not just our leap year our Gregorian leap year but it is also a Hebrew leap year or what the Jewish people call a pregnant year because it has this extra so whereas we just add an extra day the Jewish people add an extra month so they have two Adars they have a Dar 1, which we're in right now, and then they have a Dar 2, which starts at sunset on Sunday evening. And they celebrate Purim and the Feast of Esther and all of that in a Dar 2, so that there is the right amount of time between Purim and Passover. So a Dar 2, so a Dar 1 is a, feels like a little bit of a sort of a nothing month, kind of slotted into, you know, take up space. And, um, and a Dar 2 is when all the things happen. So on Monday morning, when we look, uh, when, when we do start your week with Sally on Monday morning, I will speak a bit more about a Dar 2 and about the, the celebrations that we will be looking ahead at within the month of a Dar 2. Welcome Chantel, my friend. Welcome, welcome. Okay, so so that is um, that is what's happening at the moment. And um, so on Monday, <laughs> that's amazing. I always wonder about people. Sunette's just saying that her daughter's birthday was on the 29th of Feb. She turned one, but four this year. <laughs> Um, I'm always I always wonder what 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 happens to people whose birthdays on the 29th of February, and I also wonder what happens to Jewish people. Good morning, special Sylvia. I also wonder what happens to Jewish people who are born in that first month of Adar, you know, in Adar one, and how they look at their birthdays going forward. I, I must actually find an answer to that. I'm not sure about that. So here we are on International Women's Day. 
And so I, th I just thought it was so significant because I didn't actually, I hadn't figured out that it was, oh, thank you, my lovely Louise. Good morning, Natasha. So there we go. It's also available on Audible. Um, the Making of Biblical Womanhood by Beth Allison Barr is also available on Audible. It's so good. It is so good. In fact, that book, The Making of Biblical Womanhood, was the first book I read. Um, and it is just so good. And then you actually, part of the title, there's like, the title is The Making of Biblical Womanhood. And then there's this kind of a subtitle underneath, which is something along the lines of how the how something has subjugated women, how the history of, how the history of the Bible has subjugated women or something like that. I can't remember the exact words, but it is, um, and you just read like church history and how things were put in place to actually subjugate women. And it's, it is, it's mind blowing. Honestly, it's mind blowing. So, so here we are, we are here in this international women's month and we are here in this pregnant leap year where the Jewish people you know call it a pregnant year and pregnancy speaks of birth and we are here in the space where we've experienced a leap year and we are what was the other book um so it was the Taryn Williams book the Beth Allison by um equal equal by Katya, Katya Adams <clears throat> How, there we go. How the subjugation of women became gospel truth. Thank you so much, my friends. You saw on the ball this morning, all of you. Well, for Louise, it's the evening, but well, thank you so much. So the full title of Beth Allison Barr's book is um, the, <laughs> the Making of Biblical Womanhood, How the Subjugation of Women Became Gospel Truth. And it is brilliant. It's brilliant, honestly. And then it was How God Sees Women by Taryn Williams. And my friend Alette has put the link in her comment. And the other book was Equal by Katya Adams. So those three books I would really recommend. Okay, so here we are once again <laughs> on the 8th of March, 2024, International Women's Day in International Women's Month. And we are celebrating women. And on Monday, we started actually um, unintentionally with me, um, because I hadn't figured out that it was International Women's Month yet, but we started with the story of the woman at the well, and that was just the Holy Spirit, you know, like that is what he wanted to focus on. So we started with the story of the woman at the, of the woman at the well, and if you've missed that, please go back and listen to those, um, there was, I did three teachings on the women at the well, and then from there, I realized that it was actually International Women's Month, and then on Monday, we spoke about Eve, um, Adam and Eve, but focusing really on Eve and how incredible she was. And so in trying to decide um, the next woman that we were going to look at, I wanted to choose someone who was, all the women in the Bible are significant, but I wanted to choose someone who is not well known. And in fact, there is not a lot known about her and not a lot that has been said about her, but it is, she was clearly incredible. And I want to just look at some of the prophetic promises around this time and around, and I wanted, and bearing on this specific woman that I feel that God is saying with this specific woman. So I'm going to read out of my book, Women of Significance, volume one. And I'm reading from on page 58, and I'm reading about Deborah. Now, this is not Deborah, the prophet, the judge, the, you know, that, that Deborah. This is not the Deborah that we automatically think of when we speak about Deborah. This is a different Deborah. And there are only two Deborahs mentioned in the Bible. Only two Deborahs mentioned in the Bible. This Deborah that I'm going to speak about now, and the Deborah that we all know so well. So the first Deborah mentioned in the Bible was not the judge, prophet, leader who led Israel to victory, but a simple nursemaid, a servant who, nonetheless, was so important to the Lord that he saw fit to record her name in the annals of Scripture. Genesis 35 verse 8 in the Amplified Bible says this, But Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, 
died and was buried below Bethel under an oak and the name of it was called Alon Bacath, Oak of Weeping. We first hear of Deborah in Genesis 24 verse 59 when Laban, remember Laban, sends Rebekah, remember Rebekah, away with her nurse Deborah and Abraham's servant to be married to Isaac. So this Deborah was Rebekah's nurse and Rebekah, you will remember, was sent away to be married to Isaac. According to Jewish traditions, Deborah would have been sent specifically to look after Isaac and Rebekah's children. So one can imagine that she would have joined her mistress in fervent prayer for those children to come forth and eventually been rewarded when Jacob and Esau were born. Rebecca must have then dispatched her to look after Jacob's children once he was married. It is interesting to note that the name Deborah comes from the Hebrew word for bee, B-E-E, -E, buzzy bee, <laughs> which comes from the root meaning to speak or pronounce. Deborah was very old when she died. Some sources put her at over a hundred years of age and she was mourned to such a degree that the tree she was buried under was called the Oak of Weeping. I wonder if it was her nurturing nature, her love for community and her life-giving words. Oh my word. I can feel the anointing. I am feeling the anointing so strongly right now. Wow, Holy Spirit, will you just visit this anointing on every single person watching or listening to this? Every single person watching the live or who watches the replay afterwards. Let them feel this anointing, Lord God. Wow. I wonder if it was her nurturing nature her love for community and her life-giving words that brought such sweetness into people's lives that they so deeply mourned for her, even though she was but a servant. I love this quote from the Abiram publication's Etymology of the Name Deborah. There is no such thing as a solitary bee which makes honey on its own out of the sheer perfection of its private brilliance. Instead, the bee is a creature that consists of countless many individuals who venture about their world and do their little ordinary thing without having much sense of any difference between them and the whole hive. Isn't that how we are supposed to feel about the body of Christ of which we are a part? And so we see that there were two Deborahs mentioned in the Bible, one more seemingly significant than the other. And yet God saw fit to mention this Deborah by name. He saw fit to note how deeply she was mourned. When God asked me to do a devotional series on women in the Bible, I thought he said significant women, but he quickly corrected me and made it clear that he meant women of significance. At the time, I didn't quite understand the difference, but the story of this first Deborah makes it so clear. She was no less significant to him than the other Deborah, no less important, no less loved, no less valued and appreciated. And the activation for this, because at the end of every devotional, there's an activation and then there's a, um, a space for meditation. So it says, daughter of God, you, you, are significant. You don't need a pulpit, platform or preaching gift. You don't need to be a specific age, have a specific qualification or look a specific way to impact, to impact the world for Jesus. God does not measure significance in the same way that the world does. And the activation, and I would suggest that you all do this, on this International Women's Day, as we celebrate women around the world who are significant, have been significant, whether they are well known or not. Do this with God. Sit at the feet of Jesus and allow him to show you just how significant you are to him and what a significant part you play in God's purposes and plans for the world. Let him demonstrate to you just how significant you are. 
And I think, you know, when I wrote this and when God gave me the activation and all of that, we live in a society and the church, our church society is not very different to the world, unfortunately. Unfortunately, you know, God ordained the church to be the core around which the world revolved, that the church would influence the world to such a degree that the world would become like the church. Unfortunately, it is the other way around. We have a the core, the, we have the church actually revolving around the world and being influenced by worldly culture and the way worldly people do things. And that is unfortunately how, the, how things have transpired. And it was never supposed to be that way. It was never supposed to be that way. And so we have, as a church, we have taken on this thing about people are only significant in ministry, if they lead a church, if they ha hold a microphone, if they have a platform, if they have, you know, their faces splashed around everywhere, if they are controversial, and you know, the world loves controversial people who say things that nobody else would say. Now, yes, don't get me wrong. In many places, the gospel is very controversial. And we mustn't shy away from preaching the controversial, the controversy of the gospel. Absolutely. But when people are deliberately controversial to get likes or follows or things like that in the name of the gospel, in the name of Jesus, when we have a celebrity culture in the church that rivals the celebrity culture in the world, Houston, we have a problem. Because ultimately, the only celebrity in, of our faith is Jesus. The only celebrity of our faith is Jesus. In fact, we speak about heroes of the faith, and I understand where that concept comes from. But actually, the only hero of our faith is Jesus. Even when you look at the at the biblical authors, the people who wrote the Bible, even when you look at Paul, you know, when you look at Abraham, when you look about all of that kind of thing, Jesus is our hero of the faith. We cannot take what Paul said or what anybody else said in the Bible and make it less and make it more or mean more than what Jesus said. Everything has to be compared to what Jesus said. And that's why we, you know, we have church spaces that take that, those verses in, in the New Testament, like that verse in Timothy and the one or two others, and use it to subjugate women. When Jesus' whole ministry, if you read his whole ministry, was all about women in a time where women were probably at what it's one of, in one, in one of the times in history where women were absolutely oppressed and suppressed and had very little choice. Jesus specifically made an effort to reach out to women, to love on women, to heal women, to raise women up. And if you doubt that for one single second, then go and listen to those teachings I did on the woman at the well. Because that was what that was Jesus's aim in that story. And she became this incredible thing. That's so right, Tishka. It's about lives. How you live your life. Not likes. Not likes. And you know, I don't really like to, I mean, we all, you know, Christianity is quite a small circle. And um, especially if you're in kind of charismatic revival culture churches, then, you know, we all follow the same people. But I'm pretty sure that most of you have heard about um, what has happened at IHOP in, um, in America with Mike Bickle. And it is just simply another example of what happens when we put a man or a person on a pedestal. And because we put them on a pedestal, there is no accountability. There is no one, you know, who's able to speak into that person's life and say, you know, like that something's wrong here. You know, we need to sort something out here. 
And in fact, because I have a, a friend who's actually there at the moment at IHOP, um, and she sent me a statement that has been released by, I forget all the people whose names were on the statement, but it's like Michael Brown, Patricia King, those are two of them, who have they have released a statement saying that the, the, the allegations by some of the women against Mike Bickle have been proved true, that they themselves have actually been involved in interviewing and speaking to and all of that kind of thing. And that they are saying that they, they are not saying that Mike Bickle can never fellowship again or never be admitted into a fellowship again, but that he must never be allowed into public ministry ever again. That's the, the summary of that statement, is that in their opinion, Mike Bickle must never be allowed into public ministry ever again. In fact, they actually say there that IHOP as a brand, if you want to call it that, which already just the fact that you can say IHOP as a brand, um, you know, um, d demonstrates an issue, that IHOP as a brand has become, their, these are their words, not mine, has become cult-like in some instances. And the whole organization and the way things are run, etc., etc., needs to be re-imagined, re-done, re-renovated, however you would like to say that. And this is just another example of when somebody reaches celebrity status within our church culture and then they are surrounded or they surround themselves with people who agree with them who support them who you know who won't say a word against them and they land up with no accountability no you know no space for somebody to say hey i think there's an issue here somewhere and and what happens people are victimized people are hurt and how often is it women women who are hurt and impacted restructured conrad thank you very much that's what was what the word i was looking for restructured and men as well there are loads of men obviously who are part of ihop who loved mike bickle but we cannot do that and so that is why i've i've said here you know and 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 so what we feel as ordinary mortals should i say we feel like, you know, if we're not famous in the church circles, if we're not one that has a platform, if we're not one that holds a microphone, we are less significant than those who do. I want to tell you something, that when we step into eternity one day, we are going to be blown away by the people who God considered significant. We are going to be blown away by the people who God considers to be significant. And that is one of the reasons why God took me on this journey. Yes, Tobeka, absolutely, completely heartbreaking. That is one of the reasons why God took me on this journey through women in the Bible, named and nameless. Every single woman mentioned in the Bible that is the journey that I'm undertaking with the Lord. That is the journey that I'm writing about in this book and all the volumes to follow because I think 40 at a time is about all we can cope with. Because God is wanting to show us that there are women whose their names aren't even mentioned in the Bible. The biblical authors didn't record their name, but the things that they did were, were hinges in history and so this woman Deborah all we know about her is that she was Rebecca's nursemaid now in in Hebrew the way that you translate that word for nursemaid it probably meant that she actually breastfed um, Rebecca so nursemaids that's often what they did that's often was part of their you know that they actually physically fed the babies that they looked after maybe the mom had other children you know they had um, loads of children in those days um, and um, and so maybe you know or maybe there was an issue with the mom or whatever the case maybe women often died in childbirth in those days etc etc but often the women who were nursemaids actually physically fed 
the babies that they looked after. So she was Rebecca's nursemaid. And so when Laban sent Rebecca away, and we can look at that in uh, Genesis 24, verse 59, that I mentioned earlier. Genesis 24, verse 59. Um, it says... So they let Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And Rebekah, a Deborah, was Rebekah's nurse. And so Deborah goes with Rebekah off to marry Isaac. And she is stays with Rebekah because what happens is then the nursemaid who is nursemaid to like Rebecca, for example, then remains for as long as she possibly can, as long as she's alive, really, with the family. And she then nurses the children who come with that family. Now we know that Rebecca struggled to fall pregnant. She was barren. And then eventually she fell pregnant with, with Jacob and Esau. So you can imagine that Deborah would have been so much a part of that process of praying and pressing in and asking God to, to bless Rebecca's womb and to allow Rebecca's womb to be fruitful as Deborah, as someone who had um, looked after Rebecca from a baby, as someone who'd watched her grow up, as someone who'd seen her married to Isaac, as someone who was still part of Rebecca's life. She must have loved Rebecca. She must have been, you know, so involved in Rebecca's life. And I can imagine just by the, the things that are said about her, even though not much is known about her, that she would have been praying as well for Rebecca to fall pregnant. And then when Jacob and Esau were born, she would have been there for that. And then, so, you know, as I said before, sources say that she was very old, over 100 years old. In fact, um, one or two sources put her at like 109, round about there because she was still alive to see Jacob's children. In fact, Rachel, Jacob's favorite wife that had um, Joseph and Benjamin, died giving birth to Benjamin. Rachel died before, before Deborah. So Deborah not only raised Rebekah, but she would have been part of the raising of Jacob and Esau, and then she was with Jacob and she was part of raising Jacob's children. So if you can see this, the anointing is so strong. <laughs> it's so strong in this place. It's like God is just so on this and he so wants you all to grasp how significant you are in him and that you are no less significant than someone who is leading a church or standing behind a microphone or has a platform. In fact, there is a possibility that what you are doing and what you are interceding for and what you are birthing is, is, is going to change the world. Or every single one of us have the capacity to be world changers because every single one of us is part of the puzzle that God has put together to bring about his ultimate will and to bring his kingdom. And Deborah was just as much a part of that puzzle. She, she, forced, she saw the, the raising up of, of generations, not just one generation, but at least three generations, at least three generations of the people who would eventually become Israel, the, the people who would eventually become the 12 tribes of Israel. That was Deborah. That was this Deborah. And so nobody can tell me that this Deborah was less important than Deborah. And I love Deborah, the prophet and the judge and the leader of Israel. I love that Deborah. But this Deborah was no less important. In fact, in verse Genesis 35, verse 8, where it tells us about Deborah, Genesis 35, verse 8, where it says, And Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried. She was buried below Bethel, under an oak. And in the scriptures, it says, Under a, the terebinth tree. Under the terebinth tree. So apparently, um, scholars have said, that the word tree has been translated as oak in this verse. 
but there is a possibility that it just meant tree, that it didn't actually mean oak tree. And so, and the scholars also maintain that there is a possibility that the tree that this first Deborah was buried under is the same tree that Deborah the prophet and the judge and the mother of Israel sat under when she delivered her judgments. Remember, if you read about the story of Deborah, it tells you that she sat under a tree and delivered her judgments. I think sometimes they say a palm tree for her story, I can't remember. But the scholars believe that there is a possibility that it was the same tree, the same tree that Deborah was, was buried under, that the first Deborah was buried under, the second Deborah sat under that same tree and delivered her judgments. And I love that because isn't that just like God? Isn't that just like God? Like the second Deborah, the prophet, the judge, the mother of Israel, sat under the same tree that this woman who had physically raised Israel, physically raised the people that, that, that made Israel, Israel was buried. Wouldn't that, isn't that just like God? Isn't God just exactly like that? That he would do that because that's significant to him even if nobody else understood it. I just find that absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. And so not much is known about Deborah, her history. She was obviously a servant, so nobody knows whether she, you know, is um, was actually Israelite or whether she was um, some, you know, a different servant from a different, nobody really actually knows. But it is just absolutely amazing that here she has this, this Deborah. And so what they say, I just, I'm sorry, I'm just checking my notes to make sure I've said everything. Um, so, so apparently, um, and again, what I'm saying to you, when I say apparently, what I mean is that this is what scholars have said in some, for some, some of these, the people are, they're Hebrew scholars, um, but it's not in the biblical text. So I don't want anybody to come back to me and say to me, yeah, but it doesn't say that in the word. So when I say apparently, or scholars have said, it's just that this is what the conclusion people have reached, but it's not in the biblical text. So, you know, I don't want to make it gospel in case, you know, somebody has an issue with that. So apparently Deborah, the first Deborah, the nursemaid, died on what the Israelites call, or the Hebrew people call, or the Jewish people call, Simchat Torah. Simchat, sorry, I am just want to make sure I get that right. Um, yes, Simchat Torah. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But basically, that is the day. So in a year, in a, in a Hebrew calendar year, the Jewish people read through the Torah the whole Torah, the first, the, which is our first five books, okay? They read through the whole Torah from the start, from, from within a year. So they read from beginning to end within a year. And on Simchat Torah, if that's, or Simchat Torah, I think that's probably how, yeah, we say Torah, but I think it's more Torah. Simchat Torah, however you pronounce it, don't laugh at me unless you can speak Hebrew yourself. They reach the end of um, the Torah, their Torah reading, and they start again with the next Torah reading. So there's this thing about an ending and a birthing, or they often refer to it as an ending and a rebirthing. And, and apparently Deborah, the nursemaid, died on that day, on that day that the Torah readings are finished and then begun once again. The Jewish people celebrate that, and apparently Deborah died on that day, which is also incredibly significant because you know how many times I say to you, don't just read one verse, read a chapter, and, and preferably read the chapter before and the chapter afterwards. So I want you to see what happened after Deborah died. Deborah, Rebecca's nurse died, and she was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree. So the name of it was called Alon Bakuth. Um, the, the tree of weeping. And Elohim appeared to Jacob again when he came from Paddan Aram and blessed him. And Elohim said to him, your name is Jacob in the scriptures, but it's Jacob in our English translation. Your name is no longer called Jacob, but Yisrael is your name. So he called his name Yisrael. And in the next verse it says, and Elohim said to him, 
please feel the anointing here because I'm so feeling the anointing here. And Elohim said to him, your name is, I." and Elohim said to him, I am El Shaddai, bear fruit and increase a nation and a company of nations shall be from you and sovereigns come from your body. I am El Shaddai, bear fruit and increase. Now I want you to see the nurse Deborah dies. She's buried under the oak of weeping. And yes, we know that it's the next verse, but obviously Jacob needed to get where he was going. She dies and then she has raised. Deborah has been a part of raising all of the four, the, the foreshadowing of this tribe of Israel. She has raised uh, Rebecca. She has raised Jacob and Esau. She has helped with raising Jacob's sons, the people who, who built, who made, who the tribe of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, the nation of Israel consisted of. And here she dies after the end of her service, over a hundred years old, over a hundred years of pouring in to the generations that were the foundation for the nation of Israel. And in the very next verse, God is saying to Jacob, you will no longer be called Jacob, you will be called Yisrael. And from you, a nation will be born. Her death and then the birth of a nation, the rebirth of, of, of Jacob. Jacob was reborn in that time when God gave him a new name, a new covenant was entered into between Jacob and God. So there was the death of this incredible woman. And then there was the rebirth of Jacob as Israel. And there was the birth of Israel, the nation. Do not underestimate how significant you are. Do not underestimate the significance of some of the things that are being put to death in your life so that you can be reborn and birth what God is doing at this time in this hinge year of this decade. One of the most significant decades since Jesus walked the earth. Surrender to the process. Some of you seasons are ending. New seasons are beginning. It is okay to grieve the end of something. It is okay to grieve the end of something. They wept over Deborah. They wept over her death. That the place, the tree was called a tree of weeping. That was how much she was valued and loved and adored. They wept over Deborah. They grieved the end of that particular season. But then Jacob stepped in to his new name, to his renewed covenant with God, to his rebirth. And from him birthed a nation. From the 12 sons that Deborah had participated in raising, the nation of Israel was born. None of us like the endings of things, particularly if we aren't, you know, we, we're happy where we are. But some things have to end. Some relationships have to end. Some seasons have to end in order for you to be to step into everything God has for you. Even in order for you to step into the fullness of your identity in Jesus. And then birth what God is calling you to birth. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing? And it's all from this woman where when we read, if we're reading Genesis and we're reading the story of, of Jacob, we pay more attention to the death of Rachel and we just read past that verse about this nursemaid Deborah. And yet she was so significant, so significant. So I want to declare this over each one of you today, women and men, I want you to receive this impartation now. Women and men, 
You are significant. You don't need a pulpit, a platform or a preaching gift to be significant. You don't need to be a specific age. You don't need to have a specific qualification or look any specific way to impact the world for Jesus. God does not measure significance in the same way the world does. And I release that over each and every one of you this morning. And I speak liberation over you. I speak freedom over you from the, from the voices that tell you that, that you are not significant in the eyes of the world and in the eyes of the worldly uh, aspects or the worldly viewpoints that have infiltrated the church. I break that in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and I decree and declare that you are significant. And if you surrender to God, you will see, you will watch in astonishment how God fulfills his destiny for your life and how he does great things through you. And there might be things that you don't even know are going to change the world. But they will change the world. You might not even know it. You might not even see it in your lifetime. I don't think Deborah knew as that humble nursemaid to the generations of people who formed the nation of Israel. I don't think she knew how significant she was. She was a, 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 a humble servant woman doing her job. But God saw fit to mention her name. And we today, on this International Women's Day, in International Women's History Month, we are talking about what Deborah brought forth on the earth. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. And do not judge your significance to the kingdom by worldly standards. You are incredibly significant. And there are some parts of God's plan that cannot take place if you don't step in to what God has for you. So don't let the enemy's whispers of insignificance stop you. Grieve the ending. Be reborn birth what God has called you to birth. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope that was a Friday feast for you. I love you all. I bless you all with significance, enormous significance. And I will see all of you on Monday at 7 a.m. Love you all.